The attorney's letter came as a deep shock to me. My Uncle Jeremy had died by his own hand. The coroner's report was unequivocal. He hanged himself in the loft. My initial surprise and distress passed. I considered the news. It seemed clear that Dersetto had exercised a thoroughly morbid influence on my uncle's mind. That creaking old mansion with its unusual tales, its secret library door, the ancient upstairs clock, all those occult books that my uncle could not resist reading in spite of his fragile nerves. Fate had pointed its finger. DeSetto had trapped its prey. Mr. McCarthy, the family lawyer, suggested selling the old house. I immediately opposed the idea. My duty is clear. I must go to DeSetto. I tremble at the thought of those dark corridors, those brooding portraits. Yet I am convinced that Uncle Jeremy left a note, a letter of some kind explaining his fateful decision. I remember his voice saying, Look at the piano, Emily. Look harder. Maybe the secret drawer will yield up an explanation. I have the feeling things will not be so simple. Life is a mystery containing more mysteries. Jeremy taught me that much. Now is the time to confront the mysteries. Dersetto is waiting for me. I pray that my fear is nothing more than the fruit of my imagination. Nothing will ever persuade me that my uncle was insane. But why did he, according to the police report, block the loft window with the old wardrobe?
They are coming! I have freed hellish forces, and now the price must be paid. Deceto is the prey of evil. The sun has set. They will find my body, but will not have my soul! I can imagine the master's fury and the terror in the hearts of his slaves. <gasps> I hear their footsteps. Some may understand what I have done. May God forgive me. Farewell, Jeremy Hartwood. On my door, a dull brass plate says, Private Detective. The few friends I have call me Carnby. The others call me The Reptile. I don't care to think what my banker calls me. These days, I leave my letters unopened. Bills and threats to send in the receivers just ruin my day. When an antique dealer called Gloria Allen contacted me, I slipped into my best shirt, holstered my thirty-eight, and got to her shop as fast as I could. I was expecting something sordid. Blackmail, probably. Boy, was I wrong. What I was asked to do was visit a property called Dersetto, and find a piano in the loft. It was an old piano with secret drawers, the kind people who buy stuff in antique stores go crazy over. The Dusetto house is supposed to be piled high with classy junk, furniture, books, paintings. It looked like whoever owned Dusetto was about to get cleaned out. I was going to bring up the subject of money when Gloria Allen handed me a hundred and fifty dollars and a key. I kept myself from grinning at the thought of my banker's surprise. He doesn't like his victims getting away. I looked over a copy of the police report. The former owner of Dersetto, a guy called J. Hartwood, had hanged himself in the loft. The coroner concluded it was a clear-cut case of suicide. I promised Gloria Allen I'd give the place a look over. My report will be ready in a couple of days. I've been reading up on the history of the old house. 
It's the kind of place ghosts run away from in terror. Grisly murders, curses, lunacy. <laughs> Luckily, devil worship makes me smile. So, this is my idea of a paid vacation.
They are coming! Fragment of the Myth of the Golden Fleece Translation, Edouard de Villeban Hesperides Publications Then Perseus came across Ichios, who had been turned into stone. He spoke to his companions and said, Beware of the Medusa. He who looks into their eyes is doomed to the same fate as that which befell poor Ichios and will never more set eyes on Seraphos. Must we go blindfolded? asked Emelopes. Take up your bronze shields and polish them until they flash in the sun, answered Perseus. Fill your hearts with courage. May Artemis guide us as though we were an arrow from her quiver. But Emelopes was not satisfied. Why do that, Perseus? Is three inches of sharpened metal not enough to destroy these accursed creatures? Then Perseus drew his sword, which shone and glittered in the sun, and with it he dazzled Emelopes. Now what can you see? The companions of Zeus' sons laughed. Let us set to work, so that our shields may shine like mirrors.
Diary of Jeremy Hartwood September 27th, 1924 I have decided to keep this diary. Too many inexplicable events have taken place recently. Never have dreams so haunted my every waking moment. <laughs> Perhaps my romantic mind was too dull and has only now woken up to these new paths and visions. Some, seeing my recent paintings, may question my sanity. I can only ask them, what is sanity? Where does madness begin? September 28th, 1924. The night is pitch black. I am again drenched in sweat. I was wandering in the dunes, among giant standing stones. They were arranged in a circle, and the wind whistled about them. I plunged my hand into the soil and felt that repulsive thing which was trying to catch me. It seized me. I struggled to break free of its loathsome embrace and managed to tear my hand away. It was covered in sticky substance. I was gripping a knife. October 5th, 1924. The stone circle is a pentacle. Der Seto's library is filled with books on the occult. I will study those books until I find some explanation for the dreams. The visions that haunt me must be connected to my discoveries. I shall have to undertake a profound exploration of my dreams. December 16th. Dear God, I have found the knife! It was hidden here, and what I have learned fills me with apprehension. It is a sacrificial dagger belonging to some unholy cult. The thought of that blade tearing through human flesh horrifies me, yet I must continue my research. Der Seto is a storehouse of treasures. Was my father right after all? January 23rd. I spend all my days plunged in dusty books. The servants are convinced I am mad. At night, I awaken them with my screams. The dreams are draining what sanity I still have. I have tried staying awake, but in vain. My visions have changed. 
no doubt the influence of my father's research. February 7th, 1925. The Dark Man, that is what I call him, has revealed his true face to me. He appeared, as usual, near the fireplace, but this time he approached me. His terrible smile will haunt me to my dying day. His breath was ice and his burning eyes froze me. I could not move. I know, as surely as I have ever known anything, that the face I saw, the face that has turned my nights into hellish torture, is the mask of death. March 10th. My exhaustion is beyond description. The endless reading burns my eyes. It seems that pirates frequented the area. Dr. Herbert insists I keep to my bed. I have moved to another bedroom and sleep much better now. The dark man has not gone, however. I know it. He will wait for as long as he must. Unless I, Jeremy Hartwood, can find a way to send him back to whatever hell he comes from. March 11th. My poor knowledge of Greek and Latin is a serious handicap to my reading. I have, nevertheless, made a great step forward. I drew the symbol on the floor. He can no longer go there. I want him to understand that I can do the same thing in my bedroom. I can imagine his rage and frustration. Only last night he found his way back into my dreams. March 13th. The translation will seriously dent what money I have left. I cannot paint. My pictures are clearly the work of a lunatic. The collector Thornhill's embarrassed smile was proof of that. March 29th. He has come back. He found the door to my dreams. I am too weary to attempt any defense. I have no strength left to fight, and he knows it. He considers me dead already. Could I possibly? March 30th. How ironic! The cave my father sought for so many years is here! Beneath the house! Waits. The butler discovered a crack in the cellar wall. A breeze blows in through it, icy and repugnant. I am filled with horror at the thought of my father dying in this place. I will carry to my grave the vision of his face contorted in the agony of that fatal heart attack. His body was twisted. He had wept. His fingernails were torn and bloody from scrabbling at the floor. Dr. Gray concluded that death had been due to a heart attack. It was Waits, who some time later was informed that my poor father had in fact bitten off his tongue and choked on his own blood. March 31st. I explored the caverns in a dream. The dark man came with me. Strangely, I felt almost well. How can I describe what I saw? No, what words are capable of explaining such evil? I realized that my death was of no interest to him. The dark man wants something else. He seeks a body. His avid servants are now free. I am the cause. <laughs> it is almost funny. A curse is on their chateau. From the foundations to the very rooftop, I can no longer struggle, let alone eradicate the evil that grips the house. The end is very near. I can feel it. I have taken the decision to... <laughs> May he who finds this diary pray for my soul.
A Brightness from Afar by Lord Bolliskin, an account of his celebrated voyage to New England, 1824, Alistair Publications, Cambridge. Following a splendid journey, the sunny harbour came into sight. The locals were much impressed with one's arrival in their midst. One had time to sketch several of them and notice signs of degeneracy. Some children showed one their queer hands that would inspire uneasiness. Upon the promise of a few coins, a child has undertaken to reveal to one a most prodigious phenomenon of a natural order. One admits to being skeptical as to the prodigiousness of the marvel, whatever it may be. Indeed, one suspects it to be little more than an evening stroll to some charming wooden hut situated in the forest hereabouts. One will nonetheless go, for it is always well to submit to such local enthusiasms. One admits to being somewhat flabbergasted. The Milky Way shone like the fires of the apocalypse from the inky celestial vault. Certain distant stars, normally invisible to the naked eye, were clearly visible, glittering indeed with a strange intensity. The heavy clouds that had settled above the village had no hold over that place. It would be pointless to offer here the names of the constellations one perceived in utter clarity. Apart from the interminable length of such a list, one might conceivably risk being charged with exaggeration. The cross cast its shadow on the ground. The sea in the distance was dead calm. Tonight, one will return to that spot and draw those stars. Tomorrow night, one will at last see Halley's Comet in all its brilliance. The youngster will carry torches, despite one's developed sense of direction. Honed by years of travel, one feels incapable of finding one's way through the dark forest unaided. The drawings will, one is convinced, set light to the souls of men. Such a moon! One lost count of the craters, so sharply was their definition. Loath as one is to seem excessive in one's appraisal, one cannot but feel that the forest clearing is indeed a place outside the common laws of time and space. Surely it is not an hallucination. How strange to consider that idle conversation some research in the British Museum and a voyage to this backward village should culminate in so astounding a discovery. It may be that others have noticed the extraordinary nature of that place. How else could one explain the presence of that cross?
Demonia Particularis, Signs and Rituals, by Heinrich Cassell, Ring Publications. The ritual of invocation demands that the officiant be pure. We have already described the complex operations to be followed in order to call those that sleep in superior dimensions. We shall, for the present, limit ourselves to the sign of mutual recognition used amongst their number by adepts of the cult of the old ones. The sign also serves as protection when in the presence of a servant of evil. The sign resembles a blessing, save that the first and little fingers are both folded beneath the thumb whilst the second and third fingers are held up. It would appear that this sign has no effect on adepts of a certain rank with knowledge of particular secrets contained in the corpus demonicus. The use of such signs is not without considerable risk to the user during any attempt to call upon those from without. Memories by Alistair Boliskin Printed in London, A. Machen, Editor, 1833 It was during a conversation with G. that one first heard of the New England fishing village of I. The area was apparently the ideal place from which to witness unusual phenomena in space. The quality of the air along with the conjunction of several favorable factors, made one impatient to get started. Having gleaned what information one could from the British Museum, one set off with all haste. One's work on space and comets in particular had met with a warm response, and one thought it judicious to include several original sketches of the phenomenon, Sketches which one felt were sure to arouse a great deal of keen interest in the scientific circles of 1834. One refers naturally to the passage of Halley's Comet. Editor's Note Lord Boliskin's memoirs end at this point. Who knows what extraordinary contributions he might still have made had he not succumbed during his visit to New England to dementia followed by an early death in St. Andrew's Hospital.
The Trial of Captain Pregst, as reported by his faithful companion Elisha Smith, known amongst his fraternity by the awful name of Captain Ellie Hell. Transcribed from the log found aboard the wreck of the frigate Astarte by H. Hartwood. By all the devils, roared Pregst, glaring at William, the judge. Curse it, Will! It'll take much more than every cannon in the blasted navy to make me change me mind. You're the greatest blaggard that ever joined our fraternity. Am I not Pregst, captain of the Astarte and bloodiest villain in all the seven seas? Bloody Ezek, they call me. And you think I'll tell you where I hid my treasure? The tribunal of the Corsair's fraternity murmured at this. Pregst was indeed all he claimed. The judge, one-eyed William, slammed his fist on the table and silence was restored. Shut your mouth, Pregst! You didn't pay the fraternity its rightful share, and that means only one thing. You'll hang by the neck from a yard arm, you scurvy cur! Here's the rope twisted by Satan himself! You threaten me, Will? Many a man better than yourself has lived to regret holding a cutlass in my face. You'll be begging for mercy, mark my words. That shook one-eyed William, and no mistake. Danny waved his hook in the air and shouted, Prext was always a loudmouth. The law says we hang him. The jurors took up the cry, Hang him! It was Prext's turn to slam his fist on the table. He threw back his head and roared with laughter. <laughs> you fools! You want to kill what will never die? Try it! Once more, the assembled corsairs murmured. There was unease in the air. They remembered what happened to Chuck, the gizzard slitter, the man who opened his mouth once too often. It was night, and a bitter wind whipped the New England coast. Snug inside the Dead Horse Inn, one of the Astartes' men was talking. His name was Chuck, and his subject was Black Magic. He told stories of human sacrifices, voodoo rites, and zombies. He told a tale of a time when their luck was down and they were holed up in a Florida swamp. Prigged went missing. When he returned, he shouted, "'Tis the devil that guides us now, me hearties!" Whether that was true or not, the Astarte began taking loot after juicy loot. The favorite song of the Astarte's men, Crash the Bones, was replaced by a new one. A skull, go to Port Saber, to starboard, pass over that will, and with death you'll deal. If you cut a rope, cut the right, I hope. Or then, I don't mind, the death you will find. The next day, as you may have guessed, Chuck's body was found with a dagger plunged between his shoulder blades. Chuck's face was fixed in a ghastly grin. Molten lead had been poured down his throat. Whatever way things happened next, and I don't have the details, Prext was with us again, and we set sail for Florida. We anchored the frigate not far from New Orleans. Taking a few trusted companions with him, Prext set off into the swamp. They carried large wooden chests with them. Two days later, we heard shots being fired and screams. Prext arrived soon after that and claimed they'd been attacked by alligators. He alone managed to escape with his life. He went on to say that the time had come to share out the spoils of our many loots. I was given command of the Estarte, while Prext handed three chests over to the crew. The chests were full of gold and precious gemstones. The rum flowed that night and the stars shone bright. All at once I noticed a tall man dressed in black. Pregs introduced him to me. Here is a hardy mate. You can call him Keith. Many a tale he could tell. 
Craigst laughed loudly and held up a roll of parchment. <laughs> and his hideout! None better! <laughs> the parchment fell to the ground, partly unrolling. I noticed what seemed to be a map of underground tunnels, a veritable maze of caverns. Pregst continued, I'm giving up the pirate's life. The Astarte is in your hands now, my lad. She's a fine ship, and my reputation goes with her. Should any man call me coward, then break his head for me. I'm leaving you only because I found a treasure more precious than the purest of gold. <laughs> Keith spoke to him then. It is midnight. They are ready, and we must go. The stranger turned his cold eyes on me and said in a soft, chilling voice, Sometimes Pregst talks too much. Forget what he just said, and maybe you'll live. The fellow's words froze the marrow in my bones, and it was all I could do to mumble, I'll not breathe a word. The canoe slid away into the night. Their torches disappeared in the distance of the swamp. My snoring companions didn't hear the insidious rhythm of far-off drums. The Creatures of Night by Hubertus the Bald Translated from Latin by his brother in prayer, Fratre Johann Marcus Of monstrosity You who read me know that night engenders monsters and that night creatures exist. The accursed book of Abdul al-Hazred is clear on this matter. That is not dead which can eternal lie. Unhappy he who knows that book. 
Unhappy he whose eyes alight upon that foulest of texts. Unhappy he who implores the standing stones, for he will free the powers of darkness. Of the pit. Stagnant waters are like the memory of men. Beneath the surface calm, clawed beasts await and are known to initiates as the deep ones. Awaiting his prey, the Deep One seizes him and drags him down to the abyss, where Dagon, the cruel god, swims and reveres him whose name may not be pronounced. Of Libraries Unhappy he who frees the prowler, unhappy he who meets the prowler erring among the books. He generates the vagabond that comes from other spheres, he believes the vagabond does not exist. He will feel the embrace of death, for in the eyes of the vagabond, books are no more than dreams, stone no more than wind. The vagabond knows how to take the breath of the reckless. Of Strife He who speaks does not know, and believes he is able to kill the creatures of the night. Folly! Evil is conjured up by science and secrecy. He who prowls among books will perish by the blade. He who flies in the dark caverns will scream in fear. He who swims in the depths will evaporate. But he who believes he knows, knows nothing. He who knows, says nothing. Of death. There are domains more terrible than death. That is not dead which can eternal lie. Each creature is conjured up and is not dead, but returns to the origins. A monster, a science. Steel kills the vagabond who never dies. Translator's Note Here ends the manuscript of Hubertus who died in the library of the convent of Teruella in the year of our Lord, 1666. Requiescat in pace.
Juan Luis Jorge, De Biblioteca, Reflections on the Power of the Verb in Certain Texts, Archaeos Publications, 1919, Stafford. Translation does not alter the occult power contained within such forbidden texts. The malevolent energy is in no way diminished. The spell must be cast aloud and clearly in certain languages or little-known dialects. Maglafach Fatang. The reader will understand that, in the light of these revelations, I would be foolhardy to continue quoting from the text I have before me. If spoken aloud in its entirety, it would surely awaken powerful and malignant forces. I will go further and say that simple reading of some of the more technical passages describing specific practices is in itself a perilous exercise. The ill-prepared reader can easily fall prey to attacks of demented hysteria, not unlike those described in cases of individuals said to be possessed by evil spirits. I recommend the study made by Zempf, Urbain, Grandier, and Loudon, and the reports made by the Reverend Richard Price concerning a number of astonishing, to say the least, exorcisms carried out in a parish near Providence. Given what I have written, we must be grateful to the librarians of the British Museum who have never allowed consultation of the work of Al-Azib's startling work, the infamous Necronomicon. Copies of that work do exist in spite of the zeal of book-burning inquisitors. For proof, we need look no further than the British Museum, of course, and the sealed archives of the Miskatonic University in Arkham. Other examples of books whose evil can be unleashed by any thoughtless reader are von Jutz's von Unersprechlichen Kulten and the abominable De Vermis Mysteries by Ludwig Prien, whose sordid death should be a lesson to all those tempted by a study of the occult. The Sacrificial Dagger, Otto Stern, Lumina Books. The importance placed on ritual sacrifice is constant in religious cult practice. Propitiating the gods is a theme common to many religions. The Old Testament affords many examples. Primitive polytheistic belief systems integrate sacrifice in their rituals as part of the recurrent process of reaffirmation and, naturally enough, group cohesion. The members of their social and religious community come together in an act of purification and atonement. It would be erroneous to imagine the act of human sacrifice, linking priest, offering, and God, C.F. Manzetti, Stone Cults, as anything less than a vital focusing of the group's faith. The act also ensures the continuing appeasement of the God, but only if practiced by a recognized officiating priest using the appropriate instrument. Studies made concerning primitive religious groups bear witness to the central role of sacrifice in living ritual. My own work in the field of ethnopsychology brought me into contact with a sorcerer living in the region of Arkham. He introduced me to the rite of steel, linked to a ceremony known as adoring the black goat of the woods with a thousand youngs. The god, being adored, is known as the Vagabond. Here, the dagger's roar, which allows the life breath to pass from one dimension to another, is essential. The Vagabond is a frightening figure, 
being able to move where he wants and to kill those who have displeased the goat god for whom he acts as a go-between. The goat is clearly a fertility god. The priest, having spoken the invocation, must choose the appropriate dagger for the sacrifice. The knife with a sinusoidal blade that must be dipped seven times on night when the moon is full, in water that has been distilled a hundred times, will be laid aside, since it would send the vagabond back into his own dimension. See illustration. The priest will rather choose the dagger with a curved blade. That is more appropriate for slitting of the lamb's throat. This act transfigures the sorcerer priest and plunges the assembled worshippers into a divine trance. The Book of Yael, Signs of Stone, Eucharistic Rituals of Forbidden Cults. Texts collated by Monsignor Vache, legate in the Curia of the Vatican. Numerous devilish cults speak of monstrous creatures called the Old Ones. These supernatural beings are believed to be possessed of powers equivalent to those of the gods of antique religions. Adepts of such cults refer to forbidden literature in order to cause these frightful entities to appear before them. What serious student of folk myths has not come across the names of Cthulhu and Shub Nigurath? It must be said that these creatures wield tremendous power and are difficult to control once they have been unleashed into the world. Those who serve he who goes in shadows protect themselves with signs of stone carved into the walls of houses or engraved on various objects. For those misguided servants of evil, the best protection appears to be that afforded by the sign of the most ancient gods. Engraved in Menar stone, a heavy material said to be disagreeable to the touch. The sinful practices of those who fall into such errors can only lead to the darkest of despair and are a mortal danger to the soul. Such monsters as those invoked by these foolhardy individuals are engendered when reason drops its guard. Man is easily tempted into perversion. It is why we must forever remain alert and renounce Satan with each breath we take. His ways are infinite in number.
The Tale of Captain J.W. Norton of the Army of the Union. 1862. The South was in collapse. Louisiana was open to us. I had each day to requisition victuals for our troops, and was aided in this endeavor by a score of brave men. Rebels were not yet ready to lay down their arms. The region was far from safe. I headed further and further west, and questioned many freed slaves. From them, I learned of a plantation on the coast. Its name was Dersetto. We received a less than hearty welcome. Only Pickford, the owner, behaved in a friendly manner. While my men counted cattle and grain reserves, I learned what I could from him. Man was most unusual and possessed an extraordinarily cultured mind. At nightfall, I gave orders for the men to bivouac at Dersetto. Pickford invited my second-in-command, Lieutenant Patterson, and myself to dine. And our host proved a most entertaining conversationalist. While coffee was being served, Patterson went to inspect the men's camp. The cigar Pickford offered me was so acrid that my head began to spin. I remembered campfire tales of fellow officers trapped by devilish Confederate tricks. My mind floated in a foul and dense fog, from which emerged the enlarged and deformed face of Pickford. He grinned at me. Patterson's return chased off the nightmare. I heard shouts and firing from outside and found the strength to take out my revolver. I fired three shots. Pickford fell to the floor. Patterson then helped me out of the burning house. The air was filled with smoke. We resembled a company in disorderly retreat. I saw slaves leaping into the flames of that inferno. They were trying to save Pickford's life.
Memoirs of a Lost Soul The mask must fall. You who discover this manuscript understand this. I am here at your side. I am waiting in the darkness of my crypt. Soon you will belong to me. One of my slaves wrote this document. I have lived for three centuries, and my name is Ezekiel Prakst, or Elia Pickford. You may choose which to call me. I do not hide out of fear. My power is immense. I have sailed the seven seas. My ship the Astarte spread terror through all the continents. The Corsairs judged me like the Welsh judges of 1620, but they could not destroy me, and neither could the pirates. Now, I am immobilized. Damned Yankees! Witchcraft. Voodoo and the Cthulhu cult. I know them all. I have reigned and implored the stones. Only the Catonian haunts the cavern and resists me, but he dare not attack. I have need of a living body to regenerate myself. The Heartwoods managed to escape from me, but you who are reading these words, you will yield to my embrace. I hear your ragged breath. <laughs> and smell the stench of your fear. I have vanquished death. I built Deceto. I know what it is to wait. Cthulhu helps me. My servants will lay you upon the sacrificial stone. My roar will rend the night. You will be mine, and I shall reign once more. <laughs> Come to me.
Ha 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 